all of us do that, you know, at least mentally begin to prepare for what we can take and thinking through how much space we have, how big our bag is, how big the vehicle is we're going to be traveling in or the airplane we're going to be flying in. And you kind of begin to add things. Now, I've got little children, and especially with children, they like to bring everything possible. There is nothing that they want to forget, nothing they want to leave behind. And so they kind of begin to grab things that you know as a parent they won't need. They take things that you know you're going to provide for. You know there's things that they're bringing that you've already got a plan for. You know how they're going to use this, or you know you're going to have access to a washing machine, so they don't need every T-shirt in their drawer. You know you're going to provide food, so they don't need all the snacks from the kitchen. This is what Christ is doing with his disciples. He already knows he's going to provide for them. He knows how he's going to provide for them. He knows even what he's going to provide for them. And he doesn't want them to be bringing all these extra things along. He wants them to trust him. So when it comes to provisions, he limits them. Notice what they're limited to. Take nothing for their journey. How many of you would like that? Hey, you're going on a family vacation? Uh, no bags. You can't bring anything with you. You're going on a short-term missionary trip overseas, and you're not allowed to bring anything with you. That's what this is, a short-term ministry trip. And he tells them they can't bring anything except a mere staff. Now, a staff would have been like a large stick, perhaps for walking, perhaps for self-defense if they needed to against a wild animal, but it's not much. If you were limited to just a stick, you would feel like, what on earth? What am I going to do? How am I going to survive? What about food? What about, and all these questions might begin to fill your mind. Christ adds some more exceptions here. He says, a staff, but no bread, so no food, nothing to eat, no bag, don't carry anything extra with you. Don't bring anything superfluous along and no money. Don't bring any way to pay for anything that you might need because you don't have a bag and you don't have food. That's really interesting, right? That causes us kind of pause, especially in our culture. We begin to think of like, man, when we go on a trip, when we're going on a long trip, we think of all the extra things we might need. And perhaps especially we think, well, I'll at least take some extra money. So if there's anything I forgot... I can be sure to pick it up there at a nearby Walmart or something along those lines. They didn't have that. And Christ instructed them not to have that. Why would he do this? Why would Christ tell his disciples not to bring these things along? Because he's preparing them for ministry. He wants them to trust God for their daily needs. He wants them to look to God for everything that they need. And they would need a lot. Because they have so little, every single thing they would need would have to come from someone else. They would have to trust God for everything in their life. And you know what? They would see God's gracious provision. They would see it in a unique way because they had nothing to do with it. They would have nothing to do with how God provided for them, with how he worked in the hearts of others to provide for them. They would just trust him and they would see him work. And he's promising that to them by telling them, you can't take these things. He's promising to provide for them. You know, also, they would deny the worldly or earthly comforts. I think we uh, sometimes think about worldly comforts and we think of like, oh, sinful things that I might want or might need in my life and I'm going to avoid those. But we have like a lot of natural comforts. Most of us are very blessed here in America and we have a lot of things that are nice, things that are helpful, things that are beneficial for our daily life. They wouldn't have any of that. Notice what they're allowed to take in verse 9. But to wear sandals. And he added, do not put on two tunics. So they get a staff, Sandals and one tunic. How would you like to set on, on a vacation like that or to go out into ministry like that? Look with me, if you will. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 through 34. Christ was doing this to protect them as well. He wasn't just giving this, them this instruction to limit them or to hinder their ministry. He was promising to provide, but he's also going to protect them from the cares and the worries of the world. If they had to focus on all of these things, if they had to constantly be planning and preparing for their trip's itinerary and all the stops and where they were going to eat, they wouldn't have time and freedom to be able to serve the way God wanted them to serve, the way Christ was enabling them to serve. Look at Matthew 6, verses 31 through 34. And here, if these don't just kind of take on a new meaning when you think of the disciples and their situation, as he's teaching them, he says, Do not worry then, saying, What will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. 
for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. He doesn't say don't think about those things. He doesn't say that those things aren't going to be provided. He just says don't focus on those. Don't stress. Don't be anxious about how I'm going to provide. Don't worry yourself with what I'm going to do. Much like a parent does to their kid as they pack. You know what? Mom, mom and dad have the meals all planned out. You really don't need to bring those things. You know what? Mom and dad have a fun adventure planned. You really don't need to bring every toy that you have. And in the same way, Christ tells these men, you don't have to bring all these extra things because I will provide for you. This would free them up to have a singular focus. They wouldn't be caught up in the everyday affairs and everyday life. Paul writes about this in 2 Timothy 2, 3 through 4. He says, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. They're working for Christ. Their job is to please him, to carry out his ministry, to do what he's told them to do. So he says, don't worry about all the other things because you know who I am. You've seen me provide. You've seen my miracles so far. Trust me, depend on me, and I will take care of you. That is part of the promise included here as he sends them out with nothing. So let me ask you, are these a part of your thinking as a disciple of Christ? Because all of us are disciples of Christ. If you're a Christian, if you've put your faith in Christ, then you're a disciple. Maybe you don't think of yourself as a disciple, but you're a follower of Christ. You belong to him. Do you think of yourself in this way that you trust the Lord? You trust him to provide your daily needs? You know, most of us have some kind of way of relying on or depending on some other kind of human in our life for what we need. Whether it's a boss that we work for, whether it's a spouse or a friend or a company, almost all of us have some kind of, you know, or customers or clients who have to pay their bills for us to be provided for. So in some sense, all of us are kind of dependent on some other human. And yet he's encouraging them to be dependent on God for all of those things, not to look to people, not to trust people. And he's going to add to that even more in a moment. When you think of yourself and yourself as a disciple, do you trust Christ with your daily needs, with the provision that only he can give. It isn't easy. It's not an easy thing to do to trust Christ for all those things, but it is what God calls these men to. It's what he calls us to. He promises provision for them in this. And, you know, I just wanted to make a brief comment on this. It's been such a joy, as I think through our time and our ministry here, how God has provided for us through all of you, through the body here. And it's been humbling and encouraging to just see his faithfulness through his sovereign work in the hearts of everyone here. And I think when you think of your life and your ministry, you can probably look back and see people that God has used in your life to pour into you, to invest in you. And you can marvel and go, what a God. What an amazing God who provides for my needs, who provides for the body of Christ. He's still doing that for his disciples today. Not only would this uh, be provision for him, but it also would be protection. When you think of the desires that could arise in a disciple's heart. If he realized that, hey, if I go to this village, that's a really nice village. And if I go into this town and I meet with this businessman, he will really, really care super well for my needs. They might begin to have a ministry that only went where they could get certain things. They might begin to have a kind of ministry that was set up and oriented all around possessions. They might only go where they were comfortable. But when they're sent out with nothing, any place is going to be comfortable, right? Any place they go is going to be better than what they have. And so as Christ sends them out, he sends them out with nothing so that they're free to serve and even encouraged to serve everywhere they go. There's no other kind of motivations that can creep in there because any place they go is better than what they have. That's a protection also from the external influences on their ministry where someone might come along and try and buy favor with them or pay them to just be their personal teacher, to just be their personal minister. That wouldn't happen in this kind of a scenario because Christ is calling them and sending them out and protecting them from that with these encouragements here of not to take added things along, not to pile on material things. One commentator speaking of this just said, no one will take seriously messengers who claim to bring an urgent message of life and death when it becomes evident that their first concern is to secure their own ease. Interest in luxurious living can only undermine the message's gravity. 
they're talking about life and death, if they're talking about souls, and all they're concerned about is, what am I going to have for breakfast? People would realize something's inconsistent here. And so Christ, as the great discipler, as the great knower of hearts, sends them out and has prepared them for the kind of ministry they're going to walk into. He knew their desires and needs, and he would meet them. In fact, at the end of chapter 6, Christ meets the needs of 5,000 plus people, probably closer to 12,000 with the women and children. Christ provides food for all of them and for his disciples as well. And they actually have some mementos, some leftovers that they get to carry around with them as a reminder of God's provision at the end of the chapter. What a God. What a Savior who provides for his servants, who provides for his people. So, disciple of Christ, fellow believer, you and I must trust Christ for our daily needs. We must rely on him to provide for us and protect us in this world while we long for the next. We know his provision is perfect, and so we can trust him. Even when we don't always know or see exactly how he's going to work, we can trust because he promises us as he promised them to provide for and care for them and tells us as he told them not to worry, not to be anxious about these things. Our Heavenly Father knows and he cares. So the first essential of discipleship is divine preparation for ministry. It started with calling them. It started with saving them, pulling them out of their lives and careers. It started with their obedience to that call. And it's moved all the way along now to where they're being sent out for the first time. But he gives them some more instruction before he sends them out. And we're going to call this deliberate preparation for reception. He doesn't just prepare them for what they're supposed to do. He prepares them for how people are going to respond. This is kind of important. How many of you think about this when you go into an interaction with somebody and you know you're going to have to tell them something that's hard? How are they going to respond? How will I respond to what they respond? How am I going to act when... I'm received well or received poorly. Christ gives them instructions for both of those. First, the positive reception. Look at verse 10. Deliberate preparation for positive reception. Look at verse 10. And he said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave town. Pretty simple instruction, right? Whenever you come to a town, stay in one place. Find one home, stay there. Jesus knew and was slowly introducing to his disciples to the realities of ministry in a fallen world. There would be positive and negative reception just about everywhere they went. And that would come with blessings and with dangers. Their identity with Christ and a faithful proclamation of that simple message, repent and believe, was going to cause some people to repent and believe and other people to be hardened against the gospel and hardened against the messengers of the gospel. Jesus had faced this already. The disciples had already seen it. Now they're going to face it. First, the positive reception. Whenever you enter a house or wherever you enter a house, Stay there until you leave town. The Lord here notes their ministry would be blessed with provision of a place to stay. They would find homes to stay in, people who would care for them and meet their physical needs. They would find positive receptivity to their message and ministry as the Lord worked in the hearts of people who heard the message and chose to take in these disciples. They would hear the message and want to hear more. They would want to get to know these men. They would want to know more about Christ. And so they would invite these men to come to their house and ask more questions. They would keep them in their homes and have them stay for periods of time and care for them while they were in their homes. So nice hospitality from these first believers. They would find a welcome respite from traveling around in their itinerant ministry to stop and have one place to stay. You got to think this is an encouragement for the disciples. They've just been told you can't take anything with you. And now, hey, you're going to have a place to stay. Whenever you get there, find a place to stay and stay there. Th this is a blessing from God. And this is an amazing work that God does. He always cares for his servants. Here he's providing a home for them. There's a danger in this as well. There's a danger that as they are well received, as their reputation spreads, as they do these miracles, people might want to host them with ulterior motives. So it could be they're invited to a home and they decide they're going to go there, and all of a sudden somebody comes along and says, you know what, come to my house. I've got more room, and you know what? I've got some extra amenities, maybe like on Airbnb, if you've ever been on there, you can look and find all the amenities and kind of compare homes and prices. They might begin to get competing offers from people who want to care for them, who want them in, who may not always have the best of motives, and even their own motives might begin to wander. They may begin to want something different. So... Christ says, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave town. 
Be faithful in the ministry. Be faithful with those that you're serving. And don't friend hop or friend shop. Don't go looking around for a different place to stay. Go, don't go looking around for a better offer. Just love and serve wherever you are. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave town. There's also a negative reception, and we find this in verse 11. It says, any place that does not receive you or listen to you, as you go out from there, shake the dust off the soles of your feet for a testimony against them. They're supposed to move quickly past rejection. So if their ministry isn't well accepted, if it isn't appreciated, if it isn't heard or listened to, they're supposed to move on. He says, any place that doesn't receive you or listen to you as you go out from there, shake the dust off the soles of your feet as a testimony against them. This is a cultural thing that maybe we don't understand as well here, but we do understand rejection is tough. All of us understand that. None of us like to be rejected personally, and we especially don't like it when it's because of our association with someone else. So picture yourself as an early disciple. You come walking into town, you're preaching a message of repentance and faith in Christ, telling people they're sinners, telling people they need a savior. Christ is the only savior. And all of a sudden they don't like it. You called me a what? I'm a sinner? I don't like that. I don't like that message. And you said, what? I have to repent? I like the way I'm living. I like what I'm doing. And they would be rejected, but it wouldn't just be because of them. It wouldn't be something they'd done, but because of who they're following, because of Christ. And in that moment, sinful temptations might arise in their heart. They might be tempted to be defensive and rude or arrogant or argumentative to stay and try and reason with someone. That would discredit the message of the gospel. They're talking about a savior who came, who's humble and lowly, who's a servant. And they're going to stroll into town with pride and arrogance and try and correct everyone who doesn't agree with them. Obviously, that would be inconsistent. So having told these men and promised them good reception, Christ warns them, this isn't always going to be the case. You're not always going to be well-loved everywhere you go. The disciples should not lose heart upon rejection. You know, they could even have a temptation to feel kind of depressed, maybe to give up, maybe to forsake Christ. Is it really worth it to follow him if this is the response we're going to get? If people don't receive us or listen to us, they won't even take us into town. They won't hear what we have to say. How can we serve these people? How can we be involved with them? So he tells them to move on, to go out from there. Rejection is very serious, and that's why he talks about a testimony against them. Look with me back at chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. This is kind of an interesting pre-illustration for this that leads into this. So Christ comes to his hometown in Mark 6, verses 1 through 6. Jesus went out from there and came into his hometown, and his disciples followed him. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and the many listeners were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what is this wisdom given to him and such miracles as these performed by his hands? That seems positive. They're amazed. They're marveling. Verse 3, Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and among his own relatives and in his own household. And he could do no miracle there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he wondered at their unbelief. And he was going around the villages teaching. Christ comes to his hometown, and what initially seemed to be a positive reaction was really very negative. They took offense at him. Someone they knew, they were too familiar with Christ, and so they didn't believe him. They knew him as just the hometown kid. They knew him as just someone like everybody else. And rather than trusting him and responding in faith, They respond in unbelief, and Christ marvels at this or wonders at this. How can someone reject such clear teaching? How can someone reject the Messiah himself? It's a warning for the disciples. The same thing is going to happen to them. They're going to go someplace and be rejected. Christ is preparing them for that. Look with me real quick at a parallel passage in Matthew chapter 10, verses 11 through 15. In Matthew 10, 11 through 15, we get a little bit more teaching from Christ specifically kind of the comments that surround what we saw there in uh, verse 11. Matthew chapter 10, verses 11 through 15. Very similar. Christ says, In whatever city or village you enter, inquire who is worthy in it, and stay at his house until you leave that city. As you enter the house, give it your greeting. 
If the house is worthy, give it your blessing of peace. But if it is not worthy, take back your blessing of peace. Whoever does not receive you, nor heed your words as you go out of that house or that city, shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. A little more positive instruction. He says, greet the people, greet that place when you come into it. Pronounce a blessing on it. Be thankful, have a heart of gratitude. And also, if you're rejected, he tells them to leave. And he says it'll be worse than Sodom and Gomorrah, which this had to be a scary thought for the Jewish audience who would have this happen to them because they thought of themselves as better. They were self-righteous and caught in their self-righteousness and they would have thought of themselves as better than the world around them. And here, he says they're worse than the worst Old Testament example of wickedness that exists. This is the worst wickedness ever recorded in Sodom and Gomorrah. And he says it will be worse for them in the day of judgment. Back to Mark chapter 6, verse 11. The rejection of the messengers is a rejecting of the message. So if they're rejecting these men, they're rejecting Christ. And there's no way to separate the messengers from the message. This is what Christ sent them to do, and he's preparing them for the kind of reception that they're going to receive. This is just another act of kindness from our Lord. As he cares for these men, he wants them to know how to respond when they get into a situation they've never been in before. They've never been out in ministry on their own. They've never done this before, and God prepares them. He prepares them for what they ought to do, how they ought to do it, and how people are going to respond. But rejection doesn't end the ministry. The disciples are sent out elsewhere. They go out and head on someplace else. The disciples must continue to minister wherever the Lord sends them, wherever the Lord leads. Paul would later write about this kind of dynamic in Christian ministry in 2 Corinthians 2, 15 through 17. He says, For we are a fragrance of Christ to God, among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing, to the one an aroma from death to death, to the other an aroma from life to life, And who is adequate for these things? For we are not like many, peddling the word of God, but as from sincerity, but as from God, we speak in Christ in the sight of God. As we read in 2 Corinthians 5, they're ambassadors. That's the role of a Christian is to be an ambassador for the king, to go out and share a message that they know is going to have positive reception from some life to life and from some death to death, some negative In 1 Corinthians 3, Paul writes about this dynamic as well and says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So yet again, the disciples would have to trust Christ. They couldn't manufacture, they couldn't conjure up the response, they couldn't make people love them and receive them well, they couldn't really make people hate them. That would be predetermined. That would happen as they came to the city. They would experience one or the other. But they have an endless mission field as they're being launched out. Anywhere and everywhere they go, there's going to be ministry opportunities. And especially early on in this first commission, as Christ sends them out, he wants them to be be prepared for all that they're going to face. This, for them, is their first taste of ministry. Now, uh, I don't know about all of you what your first experience has been in serving Christ. Perhaps you dove into the children's department and you began teaching young people. That can be really disheartening if you start with uh, little kids because sometimes they love you and they're really excited for you on a Sunday morning in Sunday school or children's church. And sometimes they're really not. They're interested and thinking about just about everything else. The same is true for adults as these disciples go on in their ministry as they travel around. Sometimes people are gonna be really excited and fired up about them in their ministry. Other times, not so much. And yet they're supposed to trust Christ. They're supposed to rely on him. And in this time, as it's challenging, it's going to be a humbling time. They're going to go out and realize how much they need him. And every day, they're going to have to be dependent on him for their daily provision, for the opportunities of who to serve and where to serve. I think they're also going to come back and realize, hey, we need some more training. We're not quite ready to do this full time yet. We need some more help. They're going to realize their own need for faithfulness, that this isn't an easy thing. We're going to have to be really committed. We're going to have to be faithful followers of Christ. They're also going to realize a need for further character development. It will not be too much further on in the Gospel of Mark. and They're going to be arguing about who is the greatest. They're going to be debating back and forth about who is going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And it won't have anything to do with their ministry here on earth, but rather their pride and positioning 
with selfish ambition, trying to figure out who can be the greatest in God's eyes. And God, through Christ, corrects him and says, it's going to be the servant. It's going to be the one who serves. It's going to be a blessed time for them. It'll be a challenging time, a humbling time, and a blessed time. If you've ever served in any kind of capacity in a local church, it's just amazing to see how the Lord works. Things you never thought could happen, happen in an instant. Things you've been praying for for a long time come to fruition, and the Lord brings it about. It's an amazing thing. And, you know, as I just think about our time here, it's amazing to see what God has done. It's such a joy to see all of you here this morning. It's a joy to think through what the Lord does, how he uses men, how he uses each of you and your ministries, and how he uses us in our time here. And it's amazing. This is how God has always worked. This is how he's always unfolded his plan. He's bringing souls to know him, and he's hardening others. And it's been a joy to be here and see just his work and, and all of you and the work that's happened. You know, when I first heard about Countryside, that was the thing that made me go home and start praying with my wife that we could come here. And I don't know if all of you know the story, but I was at Shepherd's Conference with Pastor Rod, and he was telling me all that the Lord was doing here at Countryside and how he had grown this church and was growing the people and how healthy it was and just all the wonderful dynamics. He never said anything about needing an associate, but I went home to my wife. This was March. And we started praying that Pastor Rod would need an associate. We prayed that he would need some help. And in the Lord's providence, six months later, I got a call from Pastor Bob and he says, hey, uh, he was my pastor down at Mission Road at the time. He said, hey, um, Pastor Rod reached out to me and he wondered if uh, you'd be open to sitting and having a conversation with him. And I was overjoyed. I'd been praying for this for months. And the Lord answered our prayer. And it was just amazing to see all the details that fell into place and how he opened up the opportunity to come here and serve you. This is how God always works. This is how he always works. So we see this here with the disciples. He's opening up opportunities for them. Some positive, some negative. That's the way ministry works. That's the way the Lord works. And they would see the Lord's word come true. They would see the faith of people built. And it's an encouraging thing to see. If you work with our young people or Maybe you want to work with our young people and our students. It's such a joy to see God work in their life and do things you could never do to bring about change and to grow them to be more like Christ. So this ought to comfort our hearts just as we think through Christ's preparation for their receptions that our God knew exactly what they were going to face, that Christ knew exactly what these men were going to face and cared for them to prepare them for what they were going to see. Doesn't this careful, deliberate preparation by the Savior cause you to love him even more? When you think about your own life and the cares and burdens and worries you have, that he knows those and he's preparing you for your ministry and will use you in a mighty way. What a Savior. So to review, the first essential for discipleship was divine preparation for ministry. The second essential for discipleship or Christian ministry was deliberate preparation for reception. And our third essential of discipleship is devoted obedience to Christ. The disciples' first response to Christ's command to follow me was, and immediately they followed him. Back in Mark 1.17, I didn't read it for you earlier, but that was their response. Immediately they obeyed. They heard the call and they responded. That's what happens as well here. Look at verse 12 and verse 13. Devoted obedience to Christ. They went out and preached that men should repent. And they were casting out many demons and were anointing with oil many sick people and healing them. Having the instruction and loving care of the Lord demonstrated, the disciples now must respond with obedience. They've, they know who he is. They've heard what he said. Now it's up to them to, as we saying, trust and obey. Are they really going to trust God that he'll provide for them? Are they really going to trust his protection? Are they really going to trust his plan as it unfolds, as they're accepted and rejected in various places they go. Knowing the truth and what to do isn't enough. They have to step out in faith and do what God is calling them to do. They have to obediently leave their master for their first foray into ministry without him. Their vital connection to Christ and dependence on God for daily needs is now going to be tested. Do they really trust him? Are they really going to trust him in all these things? They will. Verse 12, they went out immediately. Here's their response. Here's how they respond when Christ speaks, when he calls them, when he gives them instruction. They obey. They went out and preached that men should repent. Here's the ministry he called them for back in Mark chapter 3 that we read. Remember, 
He summoned them to appoint them to preach. Now that's being fulfilled. Now they're actually going to become fishers of men. This is their first chance. That's got to be so encouraging for these disciples. They heard that first promise from Christ, I'll make you fishers of men, and now they get to experience it. How many of you have had that happen in your life where there's a promise in Scripture, but now it gets tested? Some trial pops up in your life. Some scenario begins to squeeze in and maybe afflict you. And you realize in that moment, God is faithful to his promises. He's doing what he said he was going to do. He's leading in the way he said he was going to lead. He's consistent with how he's always been. He's leading in the way that scripture says. Isn't that amazing? That ought to comfort and encourage our hearts. God is leading in the way he's always led. And he's being faithful to these men and they're being faithful to him. And that's where true obedience flows from. From faith and love. From a love for Christ and a desire to please him. They're preaching the same message as Christ. And here it says, they preach that men should repent. I've got a quote from a commentator here. He says, the only direct reference in Mark, or this is the only direct reference in Mark to the content of their message. We don't hear their early sermons. And uh, honestly, you know, when I came here, I asked all of you to be patient with me. You heard all of my early sermons. And unfortunately, some of them are still recorded online. But it's a learning process. It's a growing process. And that's how the Lord works, and he uses all of us together in this process. And that's a wonderful thing. Their early sermons aren't recorded, but here's their message, repent. They're calling people to believe the truth that they themselves have believed. And repentance is a fundamental preparation for the kingdom and the central message of the gospel for these people. And they go out and they preach the same message they heard, the same message their Savior had preached to them. That's encouraging. They get to do what they were called to do. They get to do what they want to do because Christ has equipped and prepared them and now sent them out. And notice in verse 13, not only were they faithful to preach the message Christ called them to, they're faithful to use the gifts that he's given them. And they were casting out many demons and were anointing with oil many sick people and healing them. God used them to faithfully minister to the people and gave them these validating signs to use their gifts and abilities in service to Christ and to others. Now, we don't believe that any of these signs are still active today, so you won't find me validating my message after the service with any of these. But this is the way God validated that early message in the church. He used these men in a mighty way, in a way that was unmistakably clear. So even if they were men, which they were, even if they had their own struggles and weaknesses, God was supernaturally empowering them to do something that was beyond what any of them could do on their own. And that's amazing. And they went out obediently and God graciously used them to extend and expand Christ's earthly ministry to other regions and areas and peoples. People that had never heard the gospel are going to hear it because of these men. This is God's plan. This has been his plan from Mark 1 all the way to Mark 6 and it continues today that God prepares and trains he uses all of us to minister the gospel. God's plan for Christ's earthly ministry centered in these men. These 12 men are who he would give his life to and for. He's constantly traveling around with them, training them, pouring into them, investing them. And we sit here today because of that, right? We know how the story goes. In Acts chapter 2, Peter, that early disciple who was called, who we can joke about his different foibles and mistakes, was used by God in a mighty way. And God used him to start the church. And through him, the church has been built. And here we are today as a testimony to that, to these men and their faithful obedience to Christ. It wouldn't be fair to not go to the end of Mark. Look at Mark 6, verses 30 through 32. We got to see kind of how this story ends. So the disciples get sent out. Then in between verses 14, all the way through 29, tell the story of John the Baptist and his beheading. And at the end, in verses 30 through 32, the disciples come back. And this is really, really a unique thing. We need to catch this. Mark 6, 30 through 32. The apostles gathered together. Now they're called apostles. That means the sent out ones. The ones who are sent out gathered together with Jesus. And they reported to him all that they had done and taught. This had to be an exciting reunion. They get back from their first trip out into ministry. Imagine, you know, if you've gone on a mission trip, you know what this is like. You come back with all your pictures and stories of who you met and where you've been and what you've seen and what you've done. And you come back encouraged by what God's doing, how he's worked, how he's used you. This is what they get to do. And they come back to Christ himself. And they probably also had 
hey, so what should I have done in this situation? What would have been a better response? How should I have handled myself? You can just imagine this conversation. And Christ, knowing their needs and wanting to meet those in verse 31, says to them, come away by yourselves to a secluded place and rest a while. For there were many people coming and going and they did not even have time to eat. And they went away in the boat to a secluded place by themselves. They get their first elders retreat, their first ministry retreat. Here they've gone out and served. They're probably tired, worn out. I don't know, you know, exactly for each of them, if they all had prosperity in the different homes they went to, or if they all went without food, without meals for a while while they were serving. But here Christ is going to meet their needs. They're going to be refreshed and encouraged with him. And actually he's going to feed the 5,000 in the following chapter. This is the first commission. This is how God works. This is how Christ uses his people. And this is amazing for us because it ought to cause us to love Christ all the more as we see him make promises and fulfill them. As we see him train and prepare and use men in ministry, move them around, send them around, the different way he works in their life and equips them and empowers them. It's an encouraging thing. It's encouraging to watch and read about in scripture. And it's encouraging to watch and see in real life. And it's amazing that God still works in this way. Allow me to wrap up with just a few closing considerations. First, just as the disciples needed to trust God's leading and timing in their lives, we must do so today. We must trust Christ fully with our lives, even as we've sung, take my life and let it be. Here's who I am. Here's what I am. Here's what I'm doing. I want it to be all yours, and I'm going to trust you with the results because I love you, because I follow you. We must trust how he leads us and how he leads others. As the Lord leads Sid and I away to a new work in Katy, we're trusting him and we're seeing his provision unfold. And we know and we're trusting his provision as well for all of you. It's a joy to see Christ fulfill his promises. It's a joy to see Christ work in the way he does. Second, Faithfully following Christ means we are going to find blessed reception and positivity to the gospel message in our ministry. And then we're going to find hardness, coldness, and hatefulness as well. We talked about this a little bit in Sunday school. The world is not going to love us. The world has never loved us and probably in the near future is going to love us even less. And so it's a time for us to enjoy the fellowship we have with one another and the way that God's worked and then be ready to see as he works in the lives of others. Be ready to see God move in the hearts of people and use us in that. Let's be grateful for those moments of favor when people respond well and love the message and love us as all of you have here for us. And let those build encouragement and resolve in our hearts for the moments when they don't, because there will be those moments. Third, church, let's be found faithful when Christ comes. I don't know when that is, you know, a lot of people are talking and thinking, oh, it's got to be really soon. And we know people have said that for ages. But we have a lot of hope. We have a lot to look forward to in Christ. And let's be found faithfully obedient when he comes. That devoted obedience of the disciples then ought to be our devoted obedience today. Faithfully serving Christ, and he catches us busy and working, laboring and serving him. And we hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Nothing better could be heard from the mouth of Christ when we first meet him than that. So let's long for and look for and work for that day. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you know our needs. Lord, even as the psalmist writes in Psalm 139, you know our frame. You know the way that you've made each one of us and the different gifts and abilities you've given us, the different opportunities you've put in front of us, the different ministries we have been, are, and will be involved in. Lord, you know all the encounters that lie before us, all the people we will meet and interact with, even as we leave this morning. Lord, we want to be those who are faithful to you, who trust you and rely on you for everything. Lord, even as these early disciples had to depend on you for food and shelter, for clothing, for finances, we want to be just like that, living a life that depends on you for everything that we need. Lord, we want to obey you. We want to respond in hearts that are full of love to Christ for being our great Savior. And even as we've sung, when we look at the cross, we marvel that he would come to die for us, that he would be this our sacrifice. And we know there are many who do not know this truth yet, or perhaps who have heard and not responded, maybe even here this morning, 
May our testimony and our lives be to them one that reflects the gospel of grace and our great Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.